Mr. Brad Green is, he says he's married to April. Okay. And some of us know April. Some of us were around when Brad and April were out on their first time together. And uh, we did all we could to work it out and to make the right kind of comments. And it worked. <laughs> and they're a fine couple. He's a preacher for the Knox County Church of Christ in Knoxville, Tennessee. He holds a diploma in Biblical Studies from Tri-City School of Preaching back in 2005. He has the diploma in Biblical Studies with emphasis on apologetics and uh, PCSOP. You don't tell them what that is. 2006. He holds a degree in uh, mass communication from East Tennessee State University, 1997. You know, that sounds like you ought to be able to communicate. We're looking forward to him bringing up this lesson, and let's give good attention to what he has to say as he speaks to us on the forgotten treasure by Terry Collins. Brother David and Brother Kent Bailey were, I suppose, on one of my first dates with April. And they had a big say in actually setting the date up. So I appreciate them and helping me with that. I needed a lot of help. And uh, I appreciate my good wife, April. And I look forward to being back with her uh, Wednesday. It is good to be here in spring. Appreciate the invitation to be here and the opportunity to spend some good time with all of you present here today. The book that I read and have reviewed is entitled The Forgotten Treasure, Reading the Bible Like Jesus. The author is Gary D. Collier. An assignment like this is one which produces mixed emotions. It's not enjoyable to read false doctrines being promoted. And it's not really enjoyable to have to expose those false doctrines. It's an honor, though, and a joy to know that God has given us his word. He gave us his son, and the least we can do is defend it. When we report that a book like this, The Forgotten Treasure, is just laden with false doctrines, and we'll deal with several of them in this lecture. And obviously due to uh, time limitations for the oral presentation, there's more detail in the book. But I think you'll see that based upon the information that I'll provide you, when we harmonize it or we compare it to what God says in his word, they're not going to harmonize. And that's indeed sad. This is not an attack on the author. It's not an attack on any individual that knows the author. It's not an attack on anyone who likes the author or anyone who likes the book. It's simply a book review. And I have read the book and compared it to what God says. And that's what we're going to look at. Make a comparison between what this book teaches and what God teaches in his holy word. In the preface, Gary Collier states that the purpose of his book is to give a practical and positive answer to the question, how should we Christians read the Bible? The answer Collier proposes, like Jesus, is not proposed lightly, he says. After reading the book, however, it's easy to realize that Collier isn't asking his readers to read the Bible like Jesus. He wants people to read the Bible like he reads it. In a nutshell, we know how Jesus would read the Bible. He would read it exactly as he has commanded us to read it. He has commanded us to rightly divide it, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. He has commanded that we add nothing to it and take nothing away from it. Now that's how Jesus would read the Bible. The first thing I want us to look at as we examine 
this book, I've kind of subcategorized these things. The first one is the new hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is a big word which basically just means the study or a science of interpretation. We use hermeneutics in everyday life just to communicate with one another. They're basic principles that allow us to communicate, to understand one another, to be able to relate to one another. And without these basic principles of communication or interpretation, we wouldn't be able to get by in a normal day. D.R. Duncan uh, wrote a well-known book, textbook on hermeneutics, in which he says, men know that the laws of language must be observed in reading any other book. If they would use the same care and common sense when reading the Bible, infidelity would find no place to set the sole of its foot. Hence it becomes evident that a correct exegesis will greatly weaken the power of infidelity if not utterly destroy it. The key here is exegesis, that is looking at what God says and taking it for what it says, not adding anything into the text. The laws of language and the use of proper rules of interpretation have been employed as long as words and writings have been around. Otherwise there would be no way uh, for anyone to understand what was being written or said. Sadly, however, when men disagree with God's word, they seek to devise a new hermeneutic. That is, a new way of interpreting what God says. Rather than you using the standard principles that have been around since the beginning of time so that we can communicate and understand one another. And how we would exegete any other book that has been written, those who have differences with what God says come up with a new hermeneutic, a new way of interpreting the scripture. For example, Collier in his book defines hermeneutics as the process of translating what was meaningful in the past into what is meaningful for the present. That's a very bad definition of hermeneutics because that's not what hermeneutics is. He later adds, biblical hermeneutics is an attempt to make sense out of the bit of biblical text for each new generation. According to this definition, the reader is to ignore context, that is, what's meaningful from the past. Transform it into something new, that is, what is meaningful for the present. Furthermore, Collier's definition of hermeneutics implies that what was meaningful when God originally said it and revealed it to inspired men is not meaningful today. Moreover, it implies that the biblical text means something different to each new generation. I don't know how you could come up with a science of interpretation that would allow everybody to know exactly what something means for their generation if every generation it changes. How would you know for sure if, if the text changes what it means from one generation to the next? You couldn't possibly know if that's the right one or not. Collier attacks the classic formula, what we refer to as commands, examples, inferences, on the basis that it is inadequate in determining what is authoritative from Scripture. He does not give any evidence to prove his claim that this formula is inadequate because if it can't produce scriptural authority, then we need to know why and what formula should we use. But those answers are not given in the book. Collier then accuses others have branded those who ask questions for clarification or offer, offer alternative understandings on approach as advocates of a so-called new hermeneutic. No one seems to know what this new hermeneutic is, yet it has become a convenient label for tagging and discarding those who are doctrinally suspect or perhaps, quote, less righteous. This is kind of a pre-shot to anyone who would disagree with his definition of 
hermeneutics. In branding up anyone who would say that what he is teaching is a new hermeneutic, he brands those who would brand. <laughs> Collier is not branded as an advocate of a new hermeneutic just because he asks questions for clarification. In fact, that's not what he's doing in his book. He is an advocate of a new hermeneutic, I know this, because he came up with a, do, a new definition for hermeneutics. It's a new one. It's a definition which allows and encourages men to decide for themselves what is and what is not meaningful for right now. In order to know what God considers meaningful for the present, we must know what God considered meaningful when it was originally written. Jeremiah voiced, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own way. It's not in man to devise a way of interpreting scripture. God gave us the way to interpret scripture. The new hermeneutic that is espoused in the forgotten treasure concludes that the Bible student must distinguish between the more important issues of God's law and the minor points of God's law. To clarify, Collier says that the role of women in the church, instrumental music, divorce and remarriage are just a few examples of what are simply minor issues. By what authority Collier consider these matters minor, he does not say. It seems to me that if God took the time and saw the need to address a matter, then that matter is important. The new hermeneutic that is espoused in the forgotten treasure also exposes a big problem in understanding the Bible. It's probably a new problem that you've never heard of, and that's being familiar with it. Collier says the more familiar you are with the Bible, the less you're going to be able to understand it. I suppose then the answer to how would Jesus read the Bible is he wouldn't. Because the more you read it, the less you're going to be able to understand it. To explain this problem of familiarity, Collier recalls a time when he offered to teach a book, uh, the book of Acts for a ladies' Bible class. What do you think of when I mention the book of Acts? Collier asked. One lady replied, well, I think we've been axed to death. Collier considered her imagery appropriate because once we have studied something time and again, like we have the book of Acts, and once our particular view of the book becomes rooted in our identity, we have difficulty hearing the power of the original message. We begin to think that we have a handle on the message. How dare us. And so we may not even want to see it from new perspectives. Now it seems to me that this lady need to be asked some more. They haven't been asked enough. How could anyone read through the book of Acts and determine that that book has just been studied too much? Where we read about the institution of the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, wherein all the saved exist. How could anybody tire of studying a book like that? What about these new perspectives that he mentions? He says we hear the same thing over and over again when we study the book of Acts, but we, it makes it hard for us to see new perspectives. Is it not possible to read the book of Acts over and over and over again and come to the same conclusion? Sure it is. Is it not possible to know that this is exactly what it means? And that be the case every time we read it? Of course it is. Why then would Jesus say, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. If we can't read a book of the Bible and come to a proper conclusion every time, why would Jesus say such a thing? The more familiar one becomes with the word of God according to Collier in this book, the more apt he is to miss the original message. Further, 
Why does Collier even mention the power of the original message? Doesn't he want us to see it through new perspectives? This uh, was mentioned in a previous lecture, but the idea is it's a smokescreen. The idea of wanting to stick with the original message, but look at it at new perspectives. According to this new hermeneutic, one must somehow find and understand, as Collier puts it, the often unspoken desire of God. Collier fails to explain how we can know what the often unspoken desires of God are. Nor does Collier share some of these unspoken desires. So I don't know what these unspoken desires are, and I don't know how to find them. But somehow this new hermeneutic is supposed to get us in contact with the unspoken desire of God. The Apostle Paul says, on the other hand, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2.11. And fortunately for all of us, God revealed them unto us by His Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, verse 17. Therefore, the only way for man to know God's desires is by reading the Bible. Any unspoken desire, then, is not from God, it's from some man. This unspoken desire led Collier to conclude that there are questions that some people feel are important but are simply just not answered in the Bible. One of the questions that he sees as uh, not so important but some people do and is just not answered in the Bible is the question about creation. Apparently the Bible doesn't say anything about creation. Some people feel that that question is important. Collier states that some people read Genesis 1, 1 through 11, and they believe it says one thing. And they read 2 Peter 3, verse 8, which has absolutely nothing to do with creation, nor evolution, and they conclude that theistic evolution is true. Collier leaves the reader with the impression that both positions, even though they contradict one another and came from the same book, which is supposed to be inspired of God, he leaves the impression that they're both equally valid. This has the Bible contradicting itself. It violates the logical law of contradiction. Two antithetical propositions cannot be true at the same time and in the same sense. Something that is true cannot contradict another known truth. So either one of those is true or both are false. We know that Genesis 1 through verse uh, 1 through 11 is the account of creation. And there's no verse in the Bible which contradicts that. The Bible does indeed teach us about where we came from. Earlier in the book, Collier's thoughts caused some confusion. He commented, Scripture does not say anything about evolution. So Collier has the Scripture saying that some people see the Bible saying something about evolution, but other people see it saying nothing about evolution. Once again, another contradiction. But this is the evidence of the foolishness which exists in attempting to create a new hermeneutic. The purpose is to allow all men to believe and practice whatever each pleases. I'll try not to spend much time on this next point. It's called chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M. For more detail, read the book. The only reason I deal with this in the manuscript and will deal with it today is because it's a method by which he pr uh, promotes the new hermeneutic through his book. There's only one chapter on this chiasm, and chiasm, basic, just for the basic idea of, of understanding, is just a method of learning or studying. For instance, I'm using an outline uh, to go by. He would use a chiasm. The book kind of defines it a little bit more in detail. The idea, though, of this chiasm, according to Collier, is that the most important element is found at the center of his chiasm. The second stress point is the last item, and the third stress point is the first item. 
It's his way of showing what is most important, second most important, third most important. Very confusing. And in a book which is supposed to be about how to read the Bible like Jesus, it really makes no sense. There's no mention of chiasm in the scripture. And so to ask how would Jesus read the Bible, I, I would contend that he probably wouldn't use a chiasm. The reason that this method deserves our attention, however, is because it's one of the mechanisms Collier used to transport his nerve hermeneutic throughout his whole book. He may say there's only one chapter on it, but there's a reason the chapter's in there. <laughs> it's a very boring chapter. <laughs> it's very confusing. That's why you can read the manuscript in, my, in the book instead of reading his book, I suppose. Collier separates the book of Matthew into teaching blocks and narrative blocks. It's here that we begin to see the true purpose of the method. He writes, each teaching block ends with the phrase, when Jesus finished these sayings, and the phrase functions as a kind of literary marker to show that the teaching block is set apart from the rest of the narrative. So the chiasm, as Collier uses, to study through the book of Matthew and that's primarily the book he uses to show how Jesus would read the Bible is to separate the teachings of Jesus from that which is just narrative the rest of the story if you will the problem with this theory is that the whole of the New Testament is God's word The inspired writers of the Bible only wrote that which Jesus commanded. So everything that's in the Bible is commanded or is authorized. Collier further explains that his purpose in using the chiasm is because it allows him, that is Collier, to begin and end with the most important text. Now that's the key, isn't it? We have to have a way to decide what is the most important text and what's the lesser important texts. Understanding the emphasis of a text is one thing, however. To ignore and reject everything else is another. And that's what this chiasm is attempting to do. By using a method in which Collier gets to pick and choose the text or emphasis on the text, which he sees as important, he is able to ignore and discard text which he sees as unimportant. Thus, Collier seems to accuse Jesus of reading the Bible in such a way as to ignore and discard certain verses or teachings in the Bible. Deeming those verses worthless. Now that's blasphemous. To say Jesus would read the Bible in such a way that some of the words he commanded inspired, words to, uh, inspired men to say he would just ignore. Because they're worthless. They're unimportant. They're less important. The proof that this chiasm has no other purpose is evinced by Collier's own words. He says, I do not deny for even a minute that one may get this same message by simply reading the Gospel of Matthew. What a strange idea. Just read it. He also admits, in all fairness, I must mention that the chiastic structure in Matthew is disputed. The teaching blocks appear to be arranged chiastically within the gospel. The narrative uh, sections which surround the teaching blocks do not seem to follow the pattern. In other words, Collier has to concede that as much as he's tried to prove that this study method advances his most important text theory, he has failed. He basically denies his own proposition that the chiastic arrangement is the one which can get us as close as we will ever come to really knowing what God wanted to emphasize. On the other hand, it's good to know that in his own book he cast doubt on this method himself. Collier continues to say, we are not dependent upon the chiasm to get the message. And we should not insist that the center of the chiasm is the central theme of the gospel. So basically he's saying, this is how I come up with the most important text, but I can't 
demand that that's how you come up with the most important text. In other words, this whole chapter on chiasm is a ruse, feigned words, attempting to make merchandise of his unsuspecting readers. Though an entire chapter is devoted to the chiasm and the structure used throughout the rest of this book, Collier notes, I have not argued that the chiasm is the key to Matthew, nor have I argued that the whole book fits into a neat chiastic arrangement, for in fact, it does not. Well, if it does not, then why is there a chapter about it in your book? We know the reason. It's the mechanism he uses to promote more important text over less important texts. Only in the end notes does Collier confess, perhaps not all the narrative sections are narrative. For example, chapters 11 through 12 of the book of Matthew contain a good bit of teaching. The truth is, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3. 16 through 17. So what have we learned about chiasm? It's difficult to understand. <laughs> it's difficult to define. It's not necessary, according to Collier. And the book of Matthew doesn't actually fit the chiastic arrangement anyway. But that's what we learn from this particular chapter in his book. The purpose of this chapter is to create a vehicle by which the author can ignore and reject certain texts as just story rather than commands and uses this vehicle to encourage others to do the same. Third, this book, very distastefully, pits the law against the lawgiver. In this book, whether he knows it or not, Collier pits God against his own word. He seems to claim that Jesus would read one book of the Bible at a time, Matthew for example, ignore any and all parallel passages in the other gospel accounts as well as any other pertinent verses in the Bible which could help us understand that which we're reading. He asks what is wrong with listening to one witness at a time to hear his whole testimony the problem is you do not have the whole testimony if you just listen to one witness. If you ignore everything else that's being said, you don't have the whole testimony. The psalmist says, The sum of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances endureth forever. Psalm 119, 160. The sum of thy word is truth. Almost all false doctrines have arisen because men ignore the sum of God's truth. They simply pick and choose a verse here and there and formulate a conclusion. This is the task of the forgotten treasure. To advance the idea that some verses or texts in the Bible are more important than others. And that these lesser important verses should not cause any concern or any break in fellowship. Gary Collier also ridicules the harmony which exists in the New Testament. In fact, he uses the term harmonization pejoratively as if it's a bad word. He says we harmonize whatever we do not understand. In essence, if you are not smart enough to really interpret the scripture for your particular generation using a method which is not necessarily needed, then you just use the word harmony because you don't understand what you're saying. Collier's disdain for harmonization continues as he says, to protect the integrity of our view of the Gospels, we push the harmonization button. You can kind of get the fit. He doesn't like that word harmony. The idea that texts harmonize with one another. The harmony of the Gospels does not exist because of any one person's view. Harmony exists because God said so. And God made it so. And therefore God is against himself, according to Gary Collier's book. 
Harmonizing a parallel text does not make any inspired writer say a particular thing. Collier says that those who have problem, uh, those who abide by God's harmony of the Scripture, have produced a mashed potatoes gospel, a new gospel, form a new account, and attempt to make one inspired writer, Mark, for example, say what Matthew said, if even if Mark did not say it. When we harmonize passages which are parallel. It doesn't make one author say one thing or not. We simply take what each said and know that both are true because they are both equally inspired of God. Collier says we should resist reading Matthew in light of Paul as though they make some same point. Do they not make the same point? <laughs> if they're talking about the same subject, If they do make the same point, should it be ignored? According to Collier, Jesus would ignore and reject the writings of Paul while reading the book of Matthew. Through his barrage against the harmony of the scripture, Collier implies that Paul and Matthew disagree on the relationship of Jesus and law. As though each man, Matthew and Paul, were inspired by different gods or one or both were not inspired at all. God is the author of all the books of the Bible. To contend that each book does not harmonize with each other is to make God the author of confusion, which he is not, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Further confounding is Collier's sarcastic attack about harmonization. What one inspired writer says, they all mean. <laughs> As if God inspired men to contradict each other. Which one do you think is more logical? or Does it make sense that God would inspire two men to be on the same page and in harmony with one another? Or God would inspire two men to be in direct opposition to each other? This plot to deharmonize the Gospels is for the sole purpose of ridding the consciences of men from certain obligations commanded by God. It's very interesting to note that Collier doesn't explain how harmonizing the scripture is dangerous or wrong. He makes several accusations, but he has no evidence by which to prove these claims. It's very similar to his claim that we need to understand the often unspoken desires of God, but doesn't tell us how. He never reveals to his reader why it's wrong and sinful to examine what Mark would say, an equally inspired writer of God, about the same exact subject or event that Matthew writes about. Why is that sinful or wrong? How is that dangerous? Collier and others would have us believe that Jesus would read a text of the Bible without regard or in neglect of other equally inspired men who have written on the same topic or event. God, however, desires that we be like the noble Bereans, that we receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to see if those things be so, Acts 17, 11. Round two continues on this battle between the law and the lawgiver. Gary Collier says, God's commands, laws, are subject to the broader desires of God's heart. I don't have any idea what that means. God's laws are subject to the broader desires of God's heart? It seems that Collier believes that God's laws and the desires of God's heart are at odds with each other. Do we not see how shameful that is? To claim that God's desire in his heart is in opposition to his word? According to Collier, the inspired Matthew viewed scripture as reflecting the desire of God's heart rather than a rule book or book of laws. As such, the deeper concerns of God's heart are more important 
than the specific instructions of God's laws. No book, chapter, or verse given for that. <laughs> Where do we find the deeper concerns of God's heart? Are they not in God's word? I suppose that's one of the unspoken desires that we can't find. These deeper concerns of God's heart, which are separate and conflict with God's word, where are they? The reason there's no book, chapter, and verse for any of that is it doesn't matter how one tries or how hard one tries to pit God against his law. It's impossible to do so and be honest with the scripture. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can't separate love from keeping commands. The inspired John records by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 2 through 3. According to the Bible, God's love and commands are inseparable. Gary Collier, on the other hand, states that man must subjectively implement God's law in light of mercy, faith, justice, and love. Once again, severing God's love, justice, and mercy from the law which God gave. His subjectivism implores that when we read the Bible, Jesus, or when Jesus would read the Bible, he would focus centrally on the heart of God as it reaches out from behind the words and the contexts. Collier is obviously speaking metaphorically. But God did not write the Bible in such a way that man would have to read in between the lines and have something reach out behind the words in the context in order to understand what he said. Collier does not believe that faith, mercy, and righteousness are a part of God's law. He separates those. He says they are bounds within which the law is to be received, understood, and applied. By stating this, he has very craftily appointed those who detest commandment keeping as being faithful, merciful, righteous, and just, while labeling those who detract from his point of view as not so loving. The truth, however, is no one can be faithful, merciful, righteous, or just without God's law. Throughout this book, Collier continues to write in such a way as to pit God against himself. Basically indict God that he either did not have the ability to give us a communication that we could understand. He either didn't have the power to do it or the ability to do it or he didn't love us enough to do it. This is, according to Collier, would probably be man's downfall. But the truth is, if God is all-powerful, and he has the ability to write something in a way that you and I can understand, and he didn't do it that way, it's his fault. Collier makes it God's fault. Because you and I can't understand the scripture, according to him. The author of The Forgotten Treasure has a great deal to say about the Pharisees, and I hope you'll take the time to read that section in the book. He takes certain passages dealing with the Pharisees and misrepresents the facts about how they and the relationship with the law or they and the relationship with Jesus. He claims that Jesus came to bring a new perspective to Scripture and the Pharisees were simply bent on conflict. This skewed version of events is then used to pre uh, present those today who bring new perspectives to the scripture as Christ-like, while those who are dogmatic in the old ways of looking at scripture are in essence today's Pharisees. Jesus did not come to present a new perspective. Jesus came to fulfill the old law, Matthew 5, 17, nail it to the cross, Colossians 2, verse 14, and present a new law of his own. Hebrews 8, 13 and 12, 24. 
Jesus did not come to present a new perspective. He came to deliver a new law. The sin of the Pharisees was not that they kept the law, for in fact they did not. The Pharisees were not law keepers, they were law breakers. Jesus was not when he rebuked them, rebuking them for keeping law. He never rebuked the Pharisees for keeping law. He rebuked them for a many number of things, Matthew chapter 23. He rebuked them for saying and doing not, for binding that which God had not bound, for being hypocrites, whited sepulchers, clean on the outside, full of rottenness on the inside. But never once did Jesus accuse them or rebuke them for keeping the law. The reason they were rebuked is they were breaking the law, misapplying the law, perverting the law. In this, Collier finds himself more related to the Pharisees than he may care to think. Collier calls upon the church to follow Jesus' lead in challenging the Pharisees for reading Scripture through their own agenda. Hypocritically, anyone who dares to challenge the Colliers of the world for reading Scripture through their agenda are considered unloving, letter of the law, legalists, today's Pharisees for doing exactly what he's telling his readers to do. My time is obviously up. It's indeed sad, as I mentioned at the very onset, to read of these things being promoted. And it's sad to have to expose them, but expose them we must because there are souls being led away from the truth because of books like these. And we pray that individuals will turn away from the error that they have taught and that those who have read these things will not be led away by the sleight of hand, but will go back to the truth of God's word. Thank you, Brad. Brad's a faithful young preacher that we appreciate very much. Kind of interesting that we haven't sent you a bill for that matchmaking that we did earlier. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. I don't know what Kent's going to do about it. But thank you for coming our way and doing a good job on this. It is indeed sad to see virtually everything that is fundamental that makes the church what the Bible says the church is just being challenged. Just simply throwing everything off that might have be a part of the Lord's church as the New Testament sets it out in order to just have something new. And that's a sad situation indeed. As far as I know, the definition of a word is still the sign of an idea, a vehicle of thought. And that's what we have in the words of the Bible, the thoughts of God, the ideas of God. And thus he expects us to be able to understand it because he made us to be able to understand it. And he doesn't bypass the way that he made us to understand it. Behooves us then to learn how language works. Understand how it authorizes and directs and leads and guides us. And then act according to his ideas and what he said we should do. The devil knows what he's doing. He knows how to challenge. He knows where to challenge that he can get his job done in leading people away from the truth. And we thank you again, Brother Brad Green, and our regards to everybody up in East Tennessee. Is it still cold weather up there? Still warm. Still warm. Oh, well, <laughs> just wait a couple of months. We will stand adjourned, and we'll be back in here in about 12 minutes.